Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT Podcast, your all-access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate, one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship-based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Today on the AMFT podcast, we are talking to a true family therapy original. I'm talking about Dr. Howard Little. He's an internationally recognized scholar. Many of you know him as the developer of multidimensional family therapy, otherwise known as MDFT. He is a professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences at the University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine, where he has been for the last 27 years. Howard was a professor at Temple and at the University of California, San Francisco. And he's the former director of the Family Systems Program at the famed IJR. That's the Institute for Juvenile Research in Chicago. He was also the director of training at the iconic Mental Research Institute, MRI, in Palo Alto that you've read about in your family therapy textbooks. He's a board-certified diplomat in family psychology. His research focuses on the development, testing, and implementation and dissemination of his MDFT model, which was originally designed for adolescent substance abusing, mental health, and delinquency. He's received awards from AMFT, AFTA, and the Hazelden Foundation, as well as the APA. He's a PI of numerous NIH-funded studies since his first grant in 1985 that he'll mention today and has authored over 200 publications. He has touched the fabric of family therapy for the past 50 years. In this interview today, in his bombastic stream of consciousness relating, you'll hear him share stories about his time with Sal Mnuchin, Jay Haley, and other luminaries in the MFT field. Howard really has worked with everybody and is as passionate today as he was as he started his career in the mid-70s. This was quite a treat for me. And hang in there, get a sense of the energy, and you will not be sorry. At the end of the interview, I will be back. Take it away, Howard. Eli, back with you on the AAMFT podcast, and I am really happy to be joined today by the founder of Multidimensional Family Therapy, MDFT, and that is none other than Howard Little. And Howard and I have a rich shared sense of history for the profession, so he's going to tell a lot of stories today, and he's one of those guys you can talk to for a little while, and you f- I feel like I've known him a long time. So Howard, the first question is always, if you've ever listened to the show, we want to know about you and how you got interested in family therapy, specifically working with difficult youth and their families. Sure. Hi, Eli. It's a pleasure to be here. I think this is a great thing that you're doing. It's certainly uh, the modern age, right? We've got to we've got to take the work uh, in practical terms and, as you say, in personal terms to the field. That the journals and the books are one thing. They are foundational, of course, always have been. But the the people that was in some ways what got us on the map and got many of us interested that we would, you've heard many people talk about this, right? They'd go to meetings, they'd see a videotape or a live demonstration. And those days we didn't worry about that it was just a demonstration. We never said, oh, this is just a demonstration. It's not ongoing there. That became some something uh, as the field went along, you know, and uh, as an evidence of things got much more sophisticated. In in those days, it was, we would see things that we had not seen before. So it 
inspired, it created curiosity. It was different, right? The Gloria, the famous Gloria movies of the uh, Pearls and Rogers and Ellis. This, they were the great originals in their own way, of course, of, of psychotherapy. And family therapy wanted to and succeeded in uh, ideologically, theoretically, practically different from standard psychotherapy. At the same time, we kids of the day, the young ones, you know, we needed something to reference. And certainly in school and graduate school and the master's programs of the day, we learned about those folks. And Satir, of course, as the, one of the first family therapists, and, you know, thank goodness uh, there was a woman in there uh, that uh, didn't get her due in the day, but, but she was she was there, and, and others actually brought that work of hers along. But in those days, everybody knew, well, you'd see Whitaker, and he'd be amused, and what's he talking about, and uh, wait, is he really talking about his, the dreams that he has at night with a case, and what do you mean he's, he's referencing? suicide in, in the room in a conversation with the case. So uh, there was that and there was, um, of course, uh, you know, Mnuchin maybe was a, a leader of the clinical pack of the day, the, the greatest fascination, right? The breakthrough was, I, I mean, it's, it's contained in a word that's still relevant today, you know, enactment, that when this person and his colleagues and Braulio and oh, really all of them of the day brought in and refined. It was a technique. It is a technique. But if you stay with that method over a long period of time, which is what? It's simply different variations of it. But in, in essence, it's you get out of the middle of conversation in the room and you ask, you help, you coach. He would say in the day you, you challenge family members to speak to each other. It's not an encounter group thing where, or a sin and on in the old days. It's not, it's not about confrontation and spilling your guts. It, it doesn't start there and it, it, it doesn't even aim there, right, necessarily. It was the realization of, uh, when, I, when I speak to someone, they tell me, of, of course, we tell a, a, a story, a narrative, a rendition of what is with preferences and biases and point of view, sure. And as Sal would say in the day, it's canned, it's rehearsed, right? It's prepared in its own way. To sit in the room and to go around the room and, and okay, so you've been, uh, it's a step family, and okay, how long you've been married, and uh, oh, you have kids in the other marriage, and where do they, and you'd go down that sort of speak to the stepfather, let's say, speak to the mom, speak to the kids, and there'd be those series of conversations. Okay, great. But the breakthrough, and that, you know, a word like breakthrough, you could use that for lots of time. <laughs> but if, if there was ever a breakthrough in psychotherapy, let's not even talk about family therapy, let's talk about psychotherapy. A breakthrough, a, a big bang, a paradigm shift that was about the technique and the idea of change, because that's really what it is, deeply. If you stay with something like that over years, it works on, on you in so many ways, and you start to say, wow, this is deep. Uh, this is about a way of inducing, coaxing, enabling, sponsoring change possibilities. It, 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 you know, again, words are funny. Various people have gone over this, but the word change, well, it induces change. It creates change. It sponsors change. I'll say, well, yeah, but that's the tip of the iceberg too, right? So wait, these events that have, that are not canned, then there's spontaneity that happens in the room. They're not, it's like live TV, right? Anything can happen. This isn't, okay, stop, take two, although actually you do do that if a conversation starts and it goes south, you might come in and say that, you know, you know I know you try and everybody's doing their best to really address this thing and there's, there's a lot of feelings in the room right now and that's okay, I mean, l let's just try it again. Now, mom, you, you saw something different from your daughter this week, just that that night at the refrigerator and she was there late at night, she's out getting something, you came out to the kitchen. And you said she didn't say much, but she looked at you in a way. And it prompted you to turn on the light in the kitchen and to sit down at the kitchen table. 
and you were really you were pitching your heart out there you were really sharing something with her about what what was it that you said well, it was about disappointment it was about where'd you go it was about i lost my daughter you know and that talk that you had that night i'm wondering let's bring that in right now let's just continue it you you said gee wouldn't it be great if katie would just say a little more to i i felt like i was really putting it out there f for her and i haven't done that i'm yelling too much i'm i'm tense the things that are going on at work i mean her brother's really he's older he's staying out i can't control him and like she's you know 16 and it's so you see what I'm saying there? That yeah, you a, grew up. A, uh, you are a big fan of the work, just like most of our listeners out there, like myself. You saw this very powerful technique, this thing's being done, but it was about the relationship. It was about this systemic way of working. It's been often said, once you think systemically, you can think no other way. So you're a natural systemic thinker, Howard. So you you can co-locate us in time, but you were, you know, the origin of your career corresponds with the golden age of family therapy and all these model developers where they believed it was the live dazzling demo. Let's show our work. Let's get as many people as enthusiastic. And what's less important then was verifying what what we do is is actually successful in the last 30 plus years of your career has been taking what you fell in love with which is the the base of what you do is structural and strategic and experiential techniques from classic family therapy models and putting it together in a manualized organized cohesive framework of multi-dimensional family therapy and having a huge body of research behind it when, we th when mft is looked at in the larger psychological sciences and we look for hard evidence does mft work we look at models like mdft like mst like bsft all based on even though these are third wave family therapies they're all based on what you fell in love with what i fell in love with which are younger listeners when they see their models and theories it is all emanated from that so tell us howard about your own journey from uh loving and appreciating the power of family therapy to developing your own model sure graduate school was a counseling Psych, uh, the master's program was in community psychology. The uh, doctoral program is, is really counseling psychology. They were the, the family therapy part of it was on the wing, uh, but the people that I had access to were were very strong supervisors. There was a guy, Earl Goodman, back at Northern Illinois. The the guy would say, "This speaks to something that's still current." He. He, when we would get lazy and maybe we wouldn't watch the, the tapes or we'd be late for supervision. I mean, I'm talking about the medieval uh, period here, <laughs> the 1970s. And he would say, you know, you, you guys are going to wind up like a bunch of chiropractors. Uh, what? He, you know, he's really disrespecting chiropractors. But he'd say, uh, you know, you're not going to be part of anything. You, you don't want to take this work seriously. You don't see how hard this is. You don't see how complex complicated it gets when you say okay i want to work with it. what do you think it's just coming in and sitting sitting down and having a chat so from the beginning it was people like that i finished school and somehow <laughs> i get my first job as an assistant professor at temple university in counseling psychology in 1974 i said oh okay this is yeah family therapy i i that's my specialty and uh, what you think you don't know what you don't know so i took that job i represented family therapy and the psychology and counseling psychology and about a year a little less than a year later a brochure comes around in the mail i can still see it, it says you know down here this is in philadelphia yeah you know down here at philadelphia child guidance center this is just uh, after the classic book comes out, Families and Family Therapy, and Family Therapy is, it's in that, it's in that early uh, the salad days or the glory days, you know. And uh, okay, there's a real buzz about this, and oh, well, I'm supposed to be representing family therapy for master's students and PhD students up there. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm 26 years old. I just finished. <laughs> 
graduate school, I was happy to have uh, the, to to be on that sort sort of track of getting a great job with challenging responsibilities. And I, I felt, though, yeah, I'm inspired by all of this, but uh, in my heart, I knew there was a, a long way to go. And the brochure comes from the Child Guidance Clinic, and it says, yeah, there's this thing. It's called an externship, and you'd come down here for a day a week to 34th and Civic Center Boulevard, and you'd see cases right here, and you'd have a seminar every week, and you'd read things, and, um, and you'd come on other days, and the, the video library was open to you, and you'd go down and, and we'd go down and hang out as much, really as much as we could. There were only six of us in that group that first year, so this is 1975, and it doesn't say on the brochure, like, much beyond that. And it's a gener general thing. You say, oh, okay, yeah, the uh, family therapy is really well represented. There. And we sh showed up, and the interview day was, well, it, you're sitting down in the lobby, and you're dressed dressed up, and you're a kid, and you're just anxious as all can be. And, oh, uh, yeah, this could be really good to, to do this. This will help me a lot up at, uh, at my professor job. Marcia Vitiello was uh, staff, senior staff person. Uh, okay, you know, Howard, uh, come right this way, and, and Dr. Mnuchin is ready to see you now. And so you could imagine that, like, oh, okay, so you get to meet Mnuchin. Well, I went into Mnuchin's office, and it was really somehow bright that day. The sun, it was spring, glorious, sunny, day and in his office sitting behind his sort of catty corner to the desk he's sitting behind the desk but behind his right shoulder there's this sculpture it's a why i can make out it's sort of a wire wire let's say it's of a foot a little less than a foot high maybe that wide and it's of looks to be like a guy maybe a peasant guy from who knows when on a horse with a really long spear or something, and and maybe there's, then there's a little guy, uh, looks like a person next to him. But I can't really make, I'm sitting there and he's talking to me, and I can't really make, it's like, you know, the sun is in, is in the background, then there's the sculpture, the sun's coming through this wire, and then there's him, and I can't, is he smiling? I mean, is he smiling? He's, he's nice and everything. But it's like we're in there two minutes. Um, I can hardly <laughs> see him with the sun in my eyes. I don't say any, oh, do you mind if I move, you know, to get the sun in? No, I'm sitting there, and I have this, like, three things happening. The sun, the wire sculpture, and him and his face. I've never seen him before. And then the next thing you know, Marcia Vitello comes back in. Let's, I mean, a couple of minutes later. Okay, so what would your lunch orders be? The lunch orders, I, I don't <laughs> I know we're having. Uh, and uh, well, where we, well, we're getting over lunch from CHOP, from Children's Hospital. Oh, okay, well, you had a menu. And it was like the, there's, one, there's one dish, I guess, that they want, one lunch that they made in the day. Maybe it was chicken salad or something. And he says a couple of things, and Marcia says, yeah, well, there's not that many things. And then she started getting impatient. Like, uh, uh, Howard, don't be difficult here. It's just, you know, tell me you want lunch. I'm going to bring you a sandwich or something and a, and a soda. Okay. And the lunch comes in, and um, he's not saying a, a word. I mean, and, and later, within a year or two, it became clear this is a version of the family lunch session, right? So he's into eating disorder research, and what do they do? They enact, right, the, the, the girl, mostly females, the family interactions around food. And they'd be sitting in a session, and... Marsh would come in in the project and say, yeah, yeah, you want lunch, yeah. And the lunch would come in, and then they've got videos of this, and the family would be fighting or not, or disengaged or fighting, or whatever, about the lunch. And it wasn't until later they said, he did this whole thing. So he was doing with me, and this became the deepest lesson of all, because whether it was Mnuchin or Haley uh, or, or Braulio later, those were... I mean, clinically, to have access as a kid, right, to senior people who could 
it, it wasn't just the talk. It was everything, right? Yeah, so you're had, describing an isomorphic process, exactly. basically. The, the way they worked with you, you being a part of those lunches, and you were there as a young man being a fully a part of it. You were joining the system, as we said. You could not separate yourself from it. They would, and then with Haley, you would see, you know, with the... Erickson back. He's a, a little misty. He's clear as could be. You know, just straight talk, not, not theory. Yeah, yeah. Of course, there's a theory there. There's a straight line in the theory. Uh, it, it's it's about be be clear and what have a sense of what good functioning is, what good interaction is. Spot it. Try and help them do better with it. I mean, it was that part. You know, you could say it's parsimonious. You could say it's simplistic. But, but things like that to me were they were foundational in that over the years to put uh, a full flesh on all of those bones, like Haley's work about the life cycle. You can have a concept of yeah, development is important, a family life cycle. Okay, teenagers, young kids, and elder. That you can have all of that in your mind as a metaphor. But over the over these years, you start to realize it's a lot. If you really want to put flesh on that, you've got to know about developmental psychology, and then came developmental psychopathology of the pathways toward dysfunction and it's not just one thing oh the kid is hanging around with crazy or antisocial oh oh of course that's why he's or she's doing no 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 things in the systemic way of course developmental psychopathology is completely and super interestingly systemic as is and had had become developmental psychology so those things changed me and i saw the, the, so the foundation was, whether it was Jay, you know, you really got to pay the stage of, of life, life cycle. Uh, this is foundational and how their functioning is within that. You're just going to pay really good attention. Be a normal human being. Don't be, don't fill a session with jargon or tech or, you know, obvious technique. You're just trying to find a way to be helpful. Being there when uh, Haley goes from MRI in Palo Alto to develop his relationship with to Philly, and so you're there under the learning tree of Mnuchin and Jay Haley. Do you realize at the time how special that is, or are you just in the bubble of your learning and your life? You can't get beyond who you are and what you are at the time. You're you're a kid. You're just starting out. You're just happy. I'm happy to have a job, a good job, a challenging job. I'm happy to be in a place where I was seeing things I never saw before, not just with the the mentors, the senior people, but the people that were there, the people that you met, that you interacted with when you were at – you couldn't go there enough. I got in trouble at, at Temple University. Uh, Howard, you know, I said, we noticed you're spending less time, you know, in your office hours. Yeah, of I said to myself because – I'm going down there. I'm meeting Mary Ann Walters. Pa Peggy Papp was there for a while. Steve Greenstein, these people. John Shed Moranis. I, I met therapists and saw a culture, a culture of doing clinical work that, that I came to understand as rare. Every Rich Simon and, and, and Simon's networker did a lot for the field. And Jay Lappin wrote a terrific a bio a, paper on uh, Braulio, and I think the title was something like, When Every Session Matters. About We actually Braulio. just talked to Jay about Braulio and uh, Sal, and he had some amazing stories, but you there at this great place that really was like a think tank, an incubator for everything systemic and family therapy, and the cool thing about your career, you go from there to another place that I don't think gets enough mention in the history of family therapy that certainly is near and dear to my heart, getting breaking uh, ground in Chicago and, and working with lots of people you worked with, including uh, Dick Schwartz, uh, Doug Brenlin, Betty McCune. And I'm talking about the Institute of Juvenile Research, IJR. Also, Celia Falikoff has been on the show now. You went from one think tank to another. Tell us what you, and I, and I believe that's where the, the origins MDFT uh, came from. Tell us about your time at IJR and how special that was. One but parenthetical before we go there, you know, we say, well, okay, so Howard, gee, what? That's nice. He sat, he, you know, sat under the learning tree with those. Women. But think of it as it was not passive. It, so sit under the learning tree. We were working. We were trainees, yes. But you had cases. 
right? So you were treated, yeah, you, yeah, that, that's that group over there. They're here and they haven't been here before. But th so see what I'm saying there? There's a distinction there about, and there's a deep learning there about, yeah, they're beginners in this family therapy thing, but they're seeing cases and those are their cases. And yeah, those supervisors and the supervisors were Haley and Mnuchin. Half of the year, Jay would run you and Haley would run your cases. The other half, Mnuchin and you would run your cases. Well, it was really like Mnuchin running case because he, he was so impatient. You know, he's always in the room. But it, it, it was, there's this activity, there's this expectation, and this became a line through through everything. Don't treat them like babies. Expect them to be competent. They've got to bring themselves, as uh, you know, Bradley would say, every day. You know, uh, suit up. Every session is important. Every case, that case needs you to be a fully functioning, competent professional. And I, me, the supervisor, I'm there. We're partners in this. Let's go. Let's be helped. See what I mean? Kind yeah, it was, it was active of learning it, for sure. Exactly. And that, there's a deep lesson there all the way through through uh the ijr was amazing just total again good fortune uh, they uh, celia had left just left her borstein was the first director of family systems celia falco was the second and i was the third and oh man was that cool doug you know brilliant had an engineering uh, background from notre dame had just come from cardiff uh studied with uh brian cade and them over there and dick schwartz was the youngest i probably of us at the day he had just finished then at purdue and john constantine was there and really we were consumed we we had to justify ourselves. The Institute for Juvenile Research, the Family Systems Program, was this entity, a unit, that was charged uh, not so much with seeing cases from the community near west side of Chicago, but with training people. You're supposed to train people. Who, and those people were in public sector work. So when you say, well, there seems to be a line between what you all were doing over at IJR and the MD, yeah, exactly right, because you know hello real world at temple we had a clinic i started a community clinic okay fine but it was still a university right it was it was in a university setting and it was a community clinic but still it was based there at 13th and cecil b more and the cases were community cases and the students were were the therapists and i was trying to supervise and train them uh, but when you train when you're dealing with young professionals master's level people they've got their degree already they come in and they're at ravenswood mental health center north side they're at a hospital and uh in hillsdale uh, illinois and you know they're they're stressed they're coming in like uh, like I did on a day or a day and a half a week to see cases, real cases, cases that were referred from near West Side, from Pilsen, I mean, the Latin, Latino cases and the, uh, black um, uh, African American cases, the black kids and families. I mean, it was like you were dealing, whether you were ready or not, with public mental health and it it was so fabulous at the end of the day we say oh whoa so we were, were idealistic we got a lot of energy we knew fam oh yeah we're family therapy and we well you had to as the current word would be ad adapt you had to really think about things like engagement there oh, the case is referred it was really uh Oh, probation referred the case or the school referred the case or the parents are coming. Okay, yeah, that's nice. Um, and what? We're going to wait. It's 4 o'clock. It's 5 o'clock. Oh, the case is in here. Oh, uh-huh. Did you call the case? No, no, I didn't. Did you go visit the school? No. Oh, wait, he had a court hearing. Did you go to court? No, no, I didn't have time. So you and learned there, Howard. <laughs> you learned there. The you know? power of family therapy. It is great when clients want to be there and they have all the same motivation. But you work with the toughest of the tough at IJR, people that they had factors in the community, they have barriers to treatment, and yet worked with a team that had to be good working with ambivalent client systems. Yes, yes. And they wanted to do, they, they were young. We were all a little older than them. But, you know, why would you work in public sector work in these mental, they didn't make 
money. They they weren't. I mean, I think it changed over the years that maybe the glow of private practice wasn't there. The opportunities for private practice weren't there. It, that was what – it was so deep. IJR, it's a state institution. You know, well, that sounds ominous. Some of juvenile delinquency research was started at this place. At, at, you know, then it was 907 South Walcott, West Side of Chicago. And, you again, you didn't know what you had, and we – what we did was it was about training therapists, but the breakthrough there was, hey, wait, oh, is anybody training? What what supervision? Let's really break that down. Oh, well, what do you, you know about supervision? Oh, yeah, sure, we know about supervision. You sit and you go over their cases and they do weeklies and they do case write-ups and, oh, right, it's family therapy, video, we do live supervision, you go over the table. Well, you start to put that list of methods, right, of supervision and training methods down in a piece of paper. Oh, that means you know how to do that? That, you know, hey, there's a theory behind each one of those things. Those fit. Those things fit like pieces of a puzzle together. Live video, case write-ups, how to do a case presentation. You know, the systematization of the work that makes people that can make people nervous. But this, you don't have to worry about it that much. All of the stuff, but the manuals and systematizing things and protocols. It's just there to get you started. Of course, creativity is always going to be there, and most fun. Fundamentally, you are always going to be there. Who you are, what you bring, your maturity, your love for the work, your compassion for people in different situations. If, if you don't have that, then, you know, get a different job. So all of these therapies, we, we've never forgotten that. We have learned every step of the way. The cases would, would remind you of that, would teach you that, you know, hey, man, don't, this isn't theory. Uh, he's not going to school. He hasn't been to school in a month. Oh, you, you want to know about the school? Oh, yeah, we'll tell you. And then you'd go and make a visit. And you couldn't get a meeting for a month. You can't get a probation officer to call you back, right? You, So you had to you'd get, go like, to them. get off your duff. You go to them. It became a, an outdoor therapy thing. We, like others, were experimenting with get, uh, getting out of the office. Wait, we're, hey, it's 5 o'clock. Mm, is the case here? It, it, after a month of that, you said, no, hey, we'd look at each other. And we were adapting. We were young, not, we weren't stupid, but we were naive, but we were flex. I think in, in our defense of the naivete, we were flexible and we said, well, okay, we got a lot of energy here and there's like a little, we, we can do something in this field, this supervision thing. Man, this is really, it, it's deep, it's complicated. I mean, Haley, those works, Haley much more than than Sal on the, uh, the the realization of what supervision and training is and the isomorphic thing, whatever we're going to call it, parallels. That and Braulio. I mean, that was a huge, uh, you know, found strength and they just knew this from the get-go. And you, they didn't lecture, it wasn't a lecturing on, you know, like all learning. It's, oh yeah, I remember this class, you know, when they did X, Y, and Z. No, it's not that. It's living it. How do we get from somebody that clearly after listening to you, you know, you could you know, you go on for a whole nother hour talking about your passion for watching the work being done, training the therapist. And I think people that have never heard you talk, they see your career, especially the last 25, 30 years. Multidimensional family therapy is known as one of our most empirically supported forms of family therapy. And you're talking about the origin of it is love, but you're known for your research. So talk to how you got from Really, I think one of your major contributions to the field is pioneering MFT. It's just this family therapy is this thing we do to know it actually works. And here, let's verify that it works and how it works. So talk about moving from this clinical piece to really this research piece that you're known for. Right. So the the, the clinical and the teaching. So the pre, I mean, at that point, it's really, wow, this this is very cool. You've, you've found something here. You, aren't you lucky? Uh, to have, have found this, I, I mean, it must be like when the CBTers or the behavior therapists, or you know, they they were in a zone of wait. This is deep. Uh, the potential. We knew the potential of each, each of those groups would know, well, not know the potential, but you'd feel there's something deep here. There's mysteries here. There's intellectual aspects of this. And oh, wait a minute. Uh, right, those things that people do with the workshops, you know, are those real cases? 
cases? Are the, and how did that case do? And what about the rest of the cases that they see? And the things from the field of does it matter? This, hey, that's nice. You worked in Chicago a few years, and you and those guys, you developed supervision models and training models. That's fabulous. Good, you know, good, good contribution. But what about, and you'd have the real critiques of the field. This, this, re, uh, this work that people are doing, does it matter? Does it, you do it at the, fam, at the institutes, at IJR. Yeah, that's great. But at Ravenswood Mental Health Center, did they take up family therapy? Do they work with families now as a result of this and that? You know, that became enormous. So in 82, I mean, again, the things... Uh, you know, people say, oh, oh, you know, this led to that, and you, and you have to be strategic in your career, right? And you plan things out, and it goes, and you think it's like, and the same presumptions about therapy, X, you know, A to B to C. Now, to have a, a general map of how things might be or how therapy is going to go, yeah, yeah, sure, you got that, but like a career, your life, it there's bounces that, you know, the Bandura paper on, on accidents in, in life and circum, circumstances. So in 81, 82, um, and I don't know, I'm walking on Baker Beach with Robert J. Green and it was a meeting, was it after something? I don't know. And, oh, Robert, man, you you know, he's out there. It's, uh, the, he's a young guy, too, and you know, he's a psychologist also. And, oh, uh, it's, it's CSPP, California School of Professional. Oh, Robert, you know, this is like, you, you're, this is God's country out here. You know, Baker Beach is right at the foot of, you know, the, the bridge, the Golden Gate. And, uh, and I'm in Chicago with the the, the, the aforementioned, aforementioned gentleman, and it was a just strong. Chicago is, you know, of course, amazing city. Lucky to have this job. We were we were getting that, that book organized and writing articles for JMFT and supervision and training. And I said, man, you're so uh, fortunate out here. This is God's country, you know, San Francisco. And I don't know, a month, two, three later, Carlos Slusky, who I, oh, okay, Carlos Slusky, well, he's, that's a big deal. Slusky and Ransom had an edited book that was so cool in terms of the, the personal side that family therapy is so much known for theory things but they went into uh, like, like the personal things personal what you're trying to do with the podcast like the, the stories the personal stuff of developing systemic ideas and Slusky you know back in the day he's a real character and just uh, on he knew everybody and uh, he was uh, the, just started as director of well, yeah just started as director of Mental Research Institute and was the uh, director of behavioral sciences in the family practice residency program in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. So he's his day job is that, and he's doing MRI. He's training, he's training family residents in how in systemic stuff. It was some of the foundation of what McDaniel and every uh, those guys did with uh, family uh, medical family therapy. And uh, yeah, Howard, and uh, I'm going to go full time down there at the, I don't know, this one, Howard, he's talking to me, Howard, I don't know who the, you know, eh, yeah, you're interested in supervision and training stuff, and that'd be really good here. And I'm going full time down at the MRI, uh, and, and I'm hearing these things, the MRI, you know, you, where, where do we genuflect? I came, you know, from the Child Guidance Clinic, and now they're talking about, he's talking about MRI. I'm saying, okay, uh, yeah, so come out, just so we'll have an interview. I mean, I don't know it's so how, how things work out. I get a job. I'm a associate professor in that department, family community medicine, t- training residents. I didn't like that so much. It didn't have the full depth of the therapy stuff. And everything is rosy and hunky-dory And uh, with this job. And uh then the story goes to uh, yeah. There's a knock on the door. I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm preparing for the, teach the residents one day and what systemic thinking and how do you translate this into medical practice? And okay, I know about family therapy. I know about cases. And we we created something called the clinic for the residents. It was good. They were, they were sort of they, they in their own way. They were family therapists working medical stuff. Anyway, so you, I get uh, a knock on the door and it's the uh, really the one who hired me. Carlos wasn't the boss. He was the boss of that. But the, the boss, the chairman was David Werdiger. David Werdiger became in the AIDS era in, San, in City and County, San Francisco, the AIDS 
czar. I mean, it was it was the the researchers down at the at General Hospital were the groundbreaking -break work that they were doing. Even Jim Sorensen down there with the psychiatry and substance abuse. But Werdiger comes in and says, "Yeah, you know, I know you talked about somebody there in Chicago you were working with, and I saw this memo, and you asked, well, why can't we get him a job out here?" And then we, George Saber, and then well, you know, we we can. can he, you want to work with him? Yes, yeah, sure. We can we can create uh, a position here. But it's really the story of welcome to a medical school where everything is, you know, the critical thing is, how's this going to get paid for? And again, you're pre pretty young in the career. And it, the piece of paper that he hands me is an announcement from National Institute on Drug Abuse. And it's a request for applications. And it says at the top, family therapy for adolescent drug abuse. And he says, well, you know, they're going to have X number of grants in this, and you ought to write a grant. And I, that really, the door closed, and I'm very gung-ho. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I saw family therapy, right? I said, that's good. And the door closes, and he leaves, and it was total panic. Like, wait, he's not only telling me this is a way to get your colleague out here, but how, Howard, you better get that this is about funding and funding up to and including, right, some part of your time for your job. So I was motivated in all kinds of ways to take a step to learn about and say, okay, we know some things and we're strong but reasonably, reasonably strong with family therapy, but being able to specify something in a grant proposal is thinking you're good with something and you can put is very different than actually doing it. George was involved in this and we do a proposal, let's say 83. Uh, oh yeah, we like this, but here's a, a few things, a few things. It was pages of until you address these things. And you went back and forth a couple of times. And then they funded only the project for the first three years. And it was going to be a study where we compared family therapy to group what we proposed family therapy to group therapy to multifamily therapy. And that was the, the the next you know big bang of of life or of a of a career so howard this is an amazing journey and i could listen to you talk all day about the people you work with and where you've been but now you're talking about the origins of mdft so for our listeners and they may know structural therapy they may know strategic and the the origins of our great profession that we love so much but talk about how mdft is a third wave family therapy and how it pays homage to our traditional models and moves us forward as far as empirical support, organization, coherence, fidelity, all of those things that are important to empirically supported treatment. Right. Uh, co coherence is a particularly good word in there. And the only thing I would add to that list, maybe that's the jumping off point, is, is a doability in uh, so-called real world settings that this... Uh, yes, the difference I, between... a. Efficacy and effectiveness. Effectiveness. A, will it work for yes, me tonight, yes, five thirty yes, in my yes. session? Yes. Right. And oh, okay, that's easy to understand. And then, but basically, the the research stuff was a way. Oh, so I always dreamed of becoming a re researcher. No, not not at all. The assuming intellectual interest, the passion was about. Oh man, it is, this stuff is deep. It's uh, hard to do. Oh, hello, every case is different. What does that mean? Like, you have ideas about what a therapy... It's life. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You have things that are standard, that you do every day, that uh, you have a philosophy of life. Okay, yeah, I want to be a good person. I want to have a job. I want to have a family, take care of each other, have love in my life, have some degree of... Really, you know, you have these... These are principles of your life. Your therapy is the same way, but the enactment, right, the way that these things show up, the systemic view. Oh, that means that you, there's a link to the great originals and then there are disconnection, disconnections. So if Whitaker would say, well, you're not going to do a, an interview unless you have the whole family there. Well, really? So all in years go by. What? All roads then of change, again, whatever change, the various things that change 
are about uh, are come through that pathway in, in the literature, it disturb or interrupt the recurring patterns. Well, what does that, that could mean a hundred things, A. B, oh wait, so it's all about interactional patterns? People like Jay LeBeau, me, uh, others were, it, we got captivated it was called, you know, first eclecticism, then it was in, in, integrative therapies. And that had a big impact on me because that the spirit of that was, hmm, what does it mean to be systemic? Is it, is, is it possible that family therapy is going to create its own kind of reductionism? That is, what's the importance of the importance and the doability of dealing with in practical ways, the social ecology, the network, the outside, right, of the family's life. Well, it's an, is that an idea we talk about in the class? Or, or do you really do go to court? You really do call a school counselor. You really do track details of, uh, okay, he's hanging. Tell me more about the kids you're hanging with. You have a piece of paper in front of you, and you say, well, there's a, there's a problems with uh, the people that he's hanging with and the arrest records of those people might even be known to you. It's, you know, to have that in a conversation or in your mind, yeah, it's important to deal with social ecology. It's important to deal with self. I mean, that was it, what Mike Nichols did, what what Dick was uh, doing, Schwartz, with, that, with, with his v- version of what's systemic. That was the insight there, and that, wait a minute, uh, or Shabbosnik in them, for that matter, with the attempt to do the one-person family therapy thing that men, many of us could see. It's not just about the whole family in the room week after week. There's many ways to come at being helpful and adaptability, flexibility. What relevance does the variability have for me? Single parent, two parent, African American family, Latino family, the family truly living in disadvantaged circumstances, the lousy schools, mental illness in the family, drug and alcohol. Each of those things are an encyclopedia, right, of of real knowledge. That real knowledge matters. It's not so. If we talk about what MDFT is, it it's a uh, it comes out of sure structural because that's where I was. But it's but there's another spirit that's in there about can you design and build in a so-called integrated therapy. In those days, we had to understand, truly understand what what drug taking was. I had no background previous to that in the drug abuse field. That's another set of encyclopedia, right, about, uh, and deal, and then dealing with the differences, because it wasn't about having them face up to their, confront them with their drug taking. No, the a developmental perspective was about understanding, and, and a systemic perspective, understanding symptom, any symptom in historical context, in its current circumstantial context, in its family context, but also in the context of self and self-development. So for me, it was, it wasn't, it, see, the, the impetus isn't you sit in a seminar or you sit in a closet, you have these insights, insights and then you go and do, no, it's the other way around. It's the cases, it's the circumstances, it's the cases that influence me us over time and if the cases will tell you what's needed the cases and their circumstances yeah anything you wanted to study came from your observations of working with youth and their families in those settings we've talked about and and that's what i think makes the model so effective is that it is based on what works ties into your love of supervision i think another thing that makes mdft works is because of the adherence and and the quality of the supervision so if if i've never heard anything about mdft or uh, what the outcomes are and where can i learn more about it tell our listeners because this is just going to wet their whistle to learning more about mdft sure so it's just uh, i mean just do you know four four letters google mdft and the website is mdft.org. You know, I want to start with the cases because the cases not only taught us over the years, but the cases and, and what we try and what is presented with that variety of cases that tells you what the model is. Engagement. Well, uh, 
why should they come? Why should they be there? Why should that kid agree to take you know to texting you to even being home to uh, saying you're going to come to my school now? You know I don't I don't want to see you there. Why should they agree to anything? They should agree if you start with you know not, I'm not an agent of probation. I'm not an agent of the school, and I'm you know what I'm not an agent of your parents either. Can there be something here? in this thing that I do for you, huh? Well, you know, I heard you, uh, I saw something on a piece of paper here, or your mom was saying, or I see something in this court record, that you were complaining about something around the house. You were complaining about school. You were complaining about these probation requirements, the drug court requirements. It's just too uh, much. I'm not, I, I don't want drug court. Let me, put, just throw me back. I'll take the felony, put me back into the, and that really got my attention. And what if we had some Thing here that could attend to, that you could speak about these things, and maybe we could get something done. Maybe there's some changes in there, some, you know, adaptations. There's some, the word that they would always latch on to is alternatives. Therapists would say, well, you know, I got, I got some different alternatives here. And the, the conversation would go on, and then they'd stop and say, well, well you said something before about alternatives. What, what are you talking about there? So you'd catch their attention because engagement was different all the way around. Sure, there's a therapeutic alliance in individual therapy, but what's family therapy? It's a series of alliances. And even that word, alliance, you know, what is it? it's, these are just technical terms. It, engagement is not that the kid or the parent, because of distress, because of despair and hopelessness, and their plate is so full and they, they're crying at night or they're so angry. Family life, their lives, the life of the kid, there's so such disruption. There is pain and agony, but there's disruption. It's not development, you know, and, and having a developmental view isn't, oh, there's some, you know, straight and narrow. No, no. It, that's not what having a developmental le- lens is about. But this engagement thing is not about they. you get them to engage with the therapy. You know what I think it is? I think it's an engagement with themselves, with each person, with the heart, their heart and soul and mind. What's happening in my life? This isn't good. I am, you know, in pain. I don't like living life like life like this. Alternatives? No, there's no alternatives. We live here. We live in Center City. Therapists would say uh, we, that's where we got into the, the things like racial socialization and what's black parenting and what does it mean to be a black man in neighborhoods and what's going on with the cops. I mean, see what I mean? The cases would tell us and we would engage with those with those realities and it wasn't engaging with the therapy. The trans the first transformation was about something's happening in my life that maybe you can help me with. The pain, the suffering, the dissatisfaction, the anger, I'm getting beaten up, uh, I'm, I'm beating people up. What, we think that people are not aware of? No, no. You give them a chance to talk about what life. They'll say, uh, your engagement, how do you engage? We're engaging at 90 in community settings now. In these 100 plus MDFT sites in the United States and I don't know, eight or so countries in Europe, you're you're able to engage cases at 90%. That is way different than the the standard from the Kasdan research and Kasdan and Nock and other people and Mike Dennis's research of what rates can you engage adolescents at in therapy? How many sessions did they come to? Coming to sessions was never the problem for us. Why? Because you, you weren't selling therapy. You were creating something through who you are, through your guts, through your knowledge, through your compassion for life. And hey, maybe things don't have to be like this forever. And it was this joining up. Mnuchin's word joining is still a good word. Yeah, you join together. You are a collaborator, a partner, and you together take 
take a breath with them individually as a family you're working in the of course you're dealing with parenting and you're dealing with monitoring parenting styles and all of that research is relevant but the core of it all it to me is this what i've said is coming coming to their lives and they say I mean, case after case, over 30, some, you know, this is different than anything we've heard. They, they'll say that. And they're not just making that up. And Howard, your, your enthusiasm, my friend, <laughs> uh, 40 plus years into your career is, is uh, contagious. It is, yeah, it is. That's just trying to, I'm not, trying I'm not to, ready to retire to, yet. To, okay. to shift you. Yeah, I know. And, 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 <laughs> and someone that has interviewed model developers and who studies these uh, common factors of change, especially in MFT, as I devoted my career to. What you've said here, we'll go full circle here, and I'll try to succinctly bring together much of what you've talked about this hour. I mean, we think that manualized treatments, oh, it's in a manual, and it's by the book, and it's removed, and it's in the ivory tower. No, what you said today is the core, is you yourself, throughout all phases of your career, working with great people in great places in these think tanks, being, first of all, loving the profession, loving the work, and learning how to engage in an authentic and real manner with family systems and clients from underserved populations that aren't naturally targets for therapy or would come to a family therapist. So this is a testament, if you've never listened to Howard Little before and you've only seen the model, it is a real life model that is based in engagement, which is our key word for today. And my friend, you are, are certainly an engaging character. And if people want to continue the dialogue with you, as many people uh, do that listen to the podcast, they want to reach out to our guest. What is the easiest way to get a hold of you, Howard? Oh, just uh, Howard at mdft.org. You know, I think that's a great idea. The 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 M- M- MFT. What's I, that's the, that's the conversation I want to have with you one day. Like you know, the M- MFT is, is is vibrant, still growing and evolving. And you know, man, there's there's some we feel there's some good work out there in MDFT. You know, so check it out. Give write to me. There's videos on the website. The articles and stuff. This the main manual is there that we've used. We could do a whole nother show on dissemination, but I will say mdft.org. I'm looking at it right now. It is geared. It is user-friendly. There are so many good resources up there. And if you have never heard about it before, now you've gotten Howard has, with his enthusiasm, has wet your whistle and you can go and follow up on it. Eli, back with you, bringing to a close another engaging episode of the AAMFT podcast. I really... Joined with Howard on his sense of history and love for our field. I really enjoyed talking to him and those stories are priceless. And what the podcast came up with the idea a couple years ago really was all about at its core. We're just setting the stage for what MDFT is all about. But the website is excellent, as he was alluding to at the end. You can find all types of fact sheets webinars and also publications that you can download that are really good whether you want to learn more about the model whether you're a potential stakeholder or agency that could use this with your population or you're just a practicing clinician on your own working with very challenging adolescent teenage population and their families we captured a lot in that interview one of the things that you could get a sense for him is how Howard was impacted by all the people he has worked with. But his mentoring has also propelled the career of influential leaders in the field who have then made their own contributions. His clinical expertise, his training and supervision have influenced thousands of therapists around the world who in turn systemically have influenced the lives of tens of thousands of youth and their families. These truly are ripple effects in his research his clinical work, and his mentoring. A quote from his colleague and friend, Dr. Cindy Rowe, sums up Howie's career perfectly. And I'd like to read that to conclude our podcast today. Cindy writes, He was a great student of family therapy, masters, and systems thinkers in the 70s. He was a pioneer in the adolescent substance abuse treatment and supervision fields in the 80s. He was an innovator in treatment development and research in the 90s, and now a leader in the dissemination of evidence-based treatments since 2000. 
Behind his clinical genius and absolutely stunning intellect, his passion is helping adolescents change their lives. He simply cannot rest knowing we can do better for teens and their families. Well said. If you want more MDFT, AMFT has you covered. You go to the online learning platform, Tenio. Go to amft.org. Go to the Enhanced Knowledge tab. Underneath that, you'll see online education and training where you will see a Howard Little Adolescence and Family Therapy Evidence-Based Treatment four and a half hour continuing education opportunity that he will further elucidate what we began toward the end of that interview around MDFT, including video presentations illustrating the four core modules of MDFT. As always, members, whether you be a student member or professional member of AMFT, get a nice discount on the Tenio online platform. We hope you check that out. I also hope you check out all the back installments of the AMFT podcast where we mix cutting edge topics with true pioneers like Howard Little in the field of couple and family therapy. Check us out wherever you find your favorite podcast. That'd be Apple Podcast, Google, Spotify. We're all there and we always appreciate a star rating and a review to help us rise through the ranks of the Mental Health Podcast. You can drop me a line, Eli at NorthstarCounselingCenter.com. You can also find me at EliCaram.com. That's E-L-I-K-A-R-A-M.com. Follow us on Twitter. The AMFT is simply at the AAMFT. I'm at Dr. Eli Live. We love hearing from you. Until next time, my friends, stay safe and stay systemic.